Hello, this is Dr. Courtney Alston. Please leave your name and message after the... Well, just kidding. Uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, it's kind of true. Yes, you can officially leave a message with Courting Happiness. We have launched our own voicemail. We have lift off, and I'm so happy to share that with you. You can leave a message about how the podcast has helped you or share a question, pitch a future topic, or simply tell us that we're doing a great job. We would love to hear that, hear from you, and much more. Grab your phone, laptop, or your tablet and leave a message right now. Go to our website at drcourtneyalston.com forward slash voicemail. That's drcourtneyalston.com forward slash voicemail. So let's get back to the podcast. Welcome to the Courting Happiness Podcast. This is a space where self-care becomes part of your day. A space where you learn evidence-based strategies to help your life, share it with those you love, and cultivate well-being at work. I'm your host, Dr. Courtney Alston. I'm a former news director, television reporter turned happiness scholar, TEDx speaker, and transformational trainer. I also understand hardships. While working my dream job in television, I lived a nightmare suddenly becoming a young widow after 86 days of marriage. Marriage. I became committed to learning more about resilience, healing, and happiness. This is how I discovered my area of research, which is positive psychology. Now I'm living my calling of training individuals and organizations on happiness. And my new chapter begins with being happily engaged. The courting and courting happiness is about a true courtship. I like to say commitment with happiness. The K in courting stands for the vulnerability of sharing my story, inspirational interviews with phenomenal people, the infusion fusion of positive psychology, and so much more. You'll learn how to commit to your well-being one episode at a time. I hope you subscribe and share. So, are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to episode 65. I'm Dr. Courtney Alston. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so happy that you're here. It's the holidays. Happy holidays. And many of us are excited about time off from work. Well, for some of us, that time means that we're away from the Scrooge in the office. Workplace bullying affects our mental health and bottom line. The Orlando Business Journal cited a study by psychologist Dr. Michael H. Harrison and found that after surveying 9,000 federal employees, 42% of women and 15% of men reported being harassed. Within two years, it resulted in $180 million in lost time and productivity. We have an expert that will help you reclaim your time and your sanity. Linda Crockett is known for pioneering the first and only full-service workplace bullying and harassment center in Canada. Her training includes a master specializing in workplace bullying and trauma, and for more than 30 years, she's worked as a therapist and social worker. Linda's clinic provides a safe, non-judgmental, and confidential space for education, treatment, and coaching. I know you're going to cherish hearing Linda's expertise and wisdom as much as I treasured interviewing and learning from her. She is phenomenal. So let's dive in. So look, I am so happy that you're here, Linda. I have been looking forward to this conversation. I just finished telling Linda that I have been following her on Instagram for the past Gosh, I know it's been longer than a few months. It must be almost a year and really, um, really following her post. And so I am so excited as relates to you being here on the podcast to talk about workplace well-being, actually workplace bullying and how it can help as relates to uh, trying to really help our well-being. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me and for being interested in this topic. This is how we really become those change makers. We share, we talk, we problem solve together. So thank you. Absolutely. You're so right in terms of that, because as soon as I started to follow all of your posts and your work and all of the great work that you're doing at your institute, it's, it's partly because I thought to myself how workplace bullying affects our well-being. 
You, the work that you're doing, I, I've highly admired. And for those who are listening right now that may have gone through levels of workplace bullying on the job, and those who may not be quite too clear on the fact of what it is, can you tell us what workplace bullying is and what it looks like? Absolutely. One of the things I want to start off with is what it's not. It is not the stereotypical childhood bullying scenario. It is not the meek and mild person being attacked by the big brute of a bully. And often size doesn't matter here. We're not talking about a big kid necessarily, big personality really. But in, in schoolyard bullying, it's primarily physical, right? Shoving into the locker, stealing our backpacks and that kind of thing. But in the workplace, it is primarily psychological harassment. And if it is not addressed, it evolves, it progresses, always progresses, and it could become psychological violence. So it's very different today than it was when our grandparents and great grandparents would have defined workplace bullying. We're all human, we evolve in society, we become much more intelligent, and we have the internet, which I call an abyss of weaponry if we want to hurt somebody. So we're far more sophisticated in our tactics today, right? We have Absolutely. these policies in our workplace that says, don't be rude, don't be abrasive, don't be incivil. We have those. So tell me a little bit more about, I guess you mentioned that workplace bullying looks very differently now. And you're absolutely right when you talked about um, the fact that it can also have a level of online harassment. Am, am, am I right? Or, or what, and or what can that look like? Well, it can look like so many things from emails to memos being sent to text messages to you know, uh, media, Facebook, all of that stuff. But I, we go to work thinking that we're safe. You know, mm -hmm. childhood bullying's over. We're adults now. We're mature. We're, intelli we're intelligent. We have these far more skills in the world. And we have policies that say we can't behave badly like we did in school. So we're not watching our backs. Unfortunately, workplace bullying is insidious. It is primarily psychological harassment. So it's not going to be blatant and in your face. One of the best ways that I like to describe it, if anyone is familiar with the quote, death by a thousand cuts, change that to psychological injury by a thousand psychological insults. So it's not the first 20 times that I might've rolled my eyes at you while we were talking, or maybe the first 10 times that I slammed a door in your face, or I created a rumor about you, or Maybe I told a lie to sabotage you so that you don't get that promotion that I want. Or maybe it's not the 50th time or the 300th time, but it accumulates over time. It chips away, chips away, chips away at who you are. And the, the most fascinating part that I've learned about this is, you know, we think it's because is there something wrong with us? Are we weak? Are we mild? Or is there something wrong with me? And that's the whole plan to make you becomes paralyzed with self-doubt, but it chips away at the strongest. It chips away at the, the most dedicated, the most maybe skilled, loyal people, ethical people in the workplace. So it's not the meek or mild child in the schoolyard. It's actually the strong, skilled person in the workplace. And it just chips away. And unfortunately, we who are targeted think we can fix it. So what we end up doing is we work harder, maybe more hours, you know, maybe I won't take my lunch break, or maybe I'll come in on a Sunday and I'll just keep working harder so that they get off my back. Because truth be told, I just want to do my job. I want them off my back. I just want to do my job. So I'll do whatever it takes to get them off my back. And we burn ourselves out. We contribute to it by now. You know, we, 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 be, we become hypervigilant in an effort to make it better, to make it go away. Unfortunately, we can't fix it. If you have a true blue bully in your workplace, you can't fix it, no matter how fantastic you are. In fact, the better you get, the worse the bullying will get. Because somewhere in that, in that dynamic, that you're a threat to them. Some way, some shape, some form. Now, you might be so full of self-doubt, you can't believe that. Because you're full of self-doubt now. And that's why we really want to encourage that you get some help by somebody who has experienced this area 
to help you see straight, think straight. Because when you are overwhelmed, stressed, and some of us are even traumatized, but when you're in that place of self-doubt, you can't see the whole picture anymore. You're just trying to survive. You're just trying to get through another day. Some people are crying on the way to work in the parking lot. Oh, you know, then you have to put your makeup back on and get back into work and soldier through the day and then you cry all the way home. You can't see all that's going on anymore. You've narrowed your perspective to survive. So what you need is somebody who's on the outside of that, a safe place, confidential place, with somebody who really gets it, who can teach you, guide you, support you, coach you, treat you if you need treatment, but be an advocate and a support for you because you can't see it all anymore. You know, that I so, I'm so glad you shared that in terms of the fact that you, um, you mentioned how it can burn you out, but also the value of having someone, a coach, someone that can support you. Because I think what happens when you're dealing with workplace bullying and you are really being abused, you know, having a lo- dealing with a level of um, harassment at work, right? It can be so overwhelming to think about what to do next. What would you recommend for that individual in terms of trying to process, you know, what to do next? Hmm. I would recommend a variety of things. So uh, everybody's in a different place and everybody's got a different background, belief system, support system. So it really has to depend on what's best for you. But I'll give you a list of things and then people can take from that. In some situations, it's best for you to learn what you can. Now, you might be too tired and too overwhelmed to go reading about it. It might be too triggering, so that might not be right for you. But you need to learn what are your rights? Where are you? Where are you as far as legislation? Is it against the law where you are or not? Look at your company policies. Is there a policy that says you're protected uh, against workplace bullying and harassment, psychological harassment? And what are the steps they want you to take? And is it safe for you to take those steps? Those are some things. Always make sure your doctor is aware that you are going through stress. Whether you have symptoms, mild, moderate, just get them documented. That is another professional documenting on your behalf, and you want that. Also, you need to document. Documenting is very, very important, not just because you want to keep a record of what's happening. It's also very important if down the road there's going to be an investigation, you need to show that you're credible. So whatever happened in January, you're gonna forget it if you don't document, you're not gonna appear too credible, you wanna be credible. The other part of documentation is for your mental health. If you don't document, get all those details down on paper, and by the way, keep that safe, in a safe place, offsite, not at work. Uh, If you're not documenting, you're gonna be laying in bed at night, two in the morning going, oh gosh, did I write that down? Where did I put that note? four in the morning, ruminating, oh no, where is that? It's in your head, it's spinning, it's ruminating. You're not sleeping. So give yourself that mental break for sleep because that's critical and it's one of the first things to go, by the way. Get it on documentation, get it in a binder, one place. Some of us, you know, do some journaling in the the bathroom, the bedroom, the kitchen and the car. (laughs) Yeah. And then that's where your head's gonna be scrambling at three in the morning. So keep it in one binder. So we've got doctor, read about your rights, learn what you can about bullying without overwhelming yourself, pace it. But most of all, get yourself somebody. Talk to your family if they're willing, if they're supportive and it's healthy. Talk to a best friend. Get it out of your body. Don't keep it inside because it's going to break down, you know, your body. You're going to end up with ulcers, gastrointestinal problems. You might end up with cardiac problems. Your autoimmune system gets attacked when you're very stressed for a very long time because this abuse is not something that happens one time or even one week. If you look at international research, it says six months or more. But as a therapist who's seen many of these cases, I see very valid cases within three months or more. So think about that stress time on your body. So make sure you get some help. Talk to a coach that has experienced this area or a therapist who's experienced this in in this area, or find one that's combined, a coach therapist. So you've got a couple of hats there and you don't have to go see several people. So talk about it, get some help, learn about it. And this person, this professional needs to and will strategize steps, next steps that are best for you. 
because every case is unique. Your needs are, are unique and you have a right to be heard. So let somebody help you develop strategies that are best for your scenario. I love that in terms of, of surrounding yourself with someone and really the team to, to serve you in terms of maybe, you know, I love how you talk about informing your doctors and having a coach and or having both a coach and therapist and, you know, having that, you know, that, that powerful dynamic within possibly one person. And then I really value the fact that you're talking about talking about it. Because I think what can be so challenging when you are dealing with harassment, um, you know, uh, dealing with, um, you know, uh, doubt, because because what happens is that harassment starts to kind of it can feed in to have a level of self doubt that the talking allows you to, I, you know, it empowers you. And, and then I, I really value that the fact that you're giving people so many great tools to empower them because it can be just a debilitating situation, unfortunately, for some of us. Well, this is very simple. It's a human experience. Like, you know, we've got research out there. You're not alone. There's policies, but this is human. We are human. And this is very similar to domestic violence and sexual assault because of the shame that shows up. Right. We work hard. And, you know, I do tend to worry a bit, little bit more about men because men have been raised to suck it up and, you know, don't admit there's a problem. And and they push it down even further. And by the time they reach out for help, they are right on the edge of that bridge, ready to jump, you know, or they're right on the edge of that heart attack. And and we know of people that have died at work from a heart attack and they've proven that it's due to workplace bullying. It's actually been proven and they've ended up with work. work um, I don't know what you call it where you are, but we call it workplace or uh, workers compensation board. And they've got the family's been compensated for their loved one's death because they've proved that it's due to this long term accumulative stress that they suffer. So you've got to talk about it. The bullies in your workplace want you to be quiet. They want you to isolate. They want you to shut down. They want you to turn your lights down and be consumed with self-doubt. You're feeding them. You're giving them the power. Now, when I went, and it takes your power away, right? So letting people talk about it is about giving you your power back. Do the opposite of what the bullies want you to do. When I went through this many years ago, I actually was diagnosed with PTSD. I hit rock bottom, a, a deep, deep bottom here. And I, I had you know, acid reflux, ulcers in my stomach. I had migraine headaches, I was insomnia, I, I had suicidal ideation, I'm not kidding you, it just, it just destroys people. It also destroys families because they're watching their loved ones suffer and diminish and isolate. So your, your spouse is suffering, your children are suffering, you're not joining them on the family Sunday dinners anymore. You're hiding, you're, you're trying to, and that's what they want, they want that. I had to come to realize that, you know what, there's doctors out there who sometimes miss symptoms in their own children. There's police officers out there whose children get arrested. I was a professional social worker and I was ashamed that I didn't realize I was being bullied at work. And I realized I have to start talking about it. I have to get loud. I have to rattle cages. I have to be relentless about it or nothing's going to change. I'm not telling everybody else to do what I did. But, you know, it's been it's been a heck of a journey shaking those cages. And we, it was it was legal in Canada to bully until just three years ago. We finally got our own legislation that we are now protected against workplace bullying. It's still weak. We still have a long way to go. But it's a big step that I didn't see. I didn't think I'd see that in my lifetime. So that is incredible. It, it, you know, I, I, I love the fact that you have really served and empowered so many people based on levels of your experience. And I, and I love that you made noise. I love that you shared that because I think that's really important to say that because it can be a very isolating dynamic when you're dealing with, um, you know, workplace bullying. Uh, I actually did a, a talk about this for a group, a couple of maybe a year ago, the pandemic has time looking very diff differently for me now, but I think it was a year ago. Um, and we talked about, you know, uh, 
what bullying can look like. But, you know, I also, uh, you know, encourage people to, uh, to, to speak, but it was interesting to hear other individual stories and, you know, from the, the person of, uh, you know, hearing someone who's, you know, supervisor has made them feel so less than that they question their work product. Yeah. And, and, and so that can be challenging because as, as, as I've dealt with some friends who have been very open, and I love that we can do that in my friendship group of, of sharing these experiences because um, it, it allows you to feel like you're not alone and it also makes you feel supported. But one of the things I've noticed within my group of friends and people that I've talked to in, in terms of speaking engagements is how it will tra- it can travel with you to the next job. So even when you get out of the shop where the workplace bully was, you may still bring that level of self-doubt that you had that was created in this previous location. And now in this new location, you're bringing this dynamic. What do you say to people as it relates to moving or growing through that? I say prioritize your recovery with or without justice. Don't wait for justice to make your decision that, okay, now I've got to go do some healing. This impacts us inside and out, psychologically and physically. So prioritize your recovery. Even if you're not sure how this has impacted you, do a check-in. You know, if we were hit by a car and we broke a leg, we would not hesitate to go to physio, see a doctor, take the medication, get the treatment. Well, this is a psychological injury. And it shows up as low self-esteem, loss of self-confidence, self-doubt. It shows up as shame. It shows up as depression, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia. It, it, it just, it really picks away at things. And maybe you don't even realize how much it's impacted you. Absolutely. The damage you might have suffered. But sometimes some of those bullies are passing on that information to the next job. And you're, you're carrying that. And then you get it again right? It it starts again in the next job. So become aware of what it is. What are the signs? What are the risks? What are the, what is the impact? What is the prevalence? Get to know those signs and those risk factors, but also, and you're documenting, you're becoming aware of your rights. So that's definitely going to help you in the next job and the next job, but you need self insight, develop your self insight, become self-aware, keep the fingers on your own pulse. When are you being triggered? What is it? What button is somebody pushing? Because I promise you, there'll be more bullies in your future. But if you have the fingers on the pulse, I I know what my buttons are today. And I've done intensive work to heal my buttons. Now, a bully could still push those buttons and they'll be tender, but they will not derail me ever again. Wow, I love that in terms of having a real understanding, self-awareness as relates to your triggers. So it won't derail you. That is just really so powerful. I'm so curious. I would love to hear your take on this because one of the things that um, I will say, because I've experienced workplace bullying on the job. And one of the things that I found uh, that has served me are boundaries, you know, creating these, but how important are boundaries as it relates to kind of empowering individuals with trying to, you know, tackle workplace bullying? Well, boundaries are so important, but I'm going to have to back up a little bit and share with you what I see in most of the people that come in to see me, because, you know, I do the coaching and the therapy piece. So what I see from most of the people, there's common characteristics of people that are targeted. And I've been doing this 11 years, so I've seen a lot, men and women from all professions. And what is incredibly consistent is that they're hardworking, dedicated, loyal, ethical, kind, well-liked, skilled people. Now, that's that's a common denominator right there, 100% consistent. There's just no denying it. But we also have, I've seen some subcategories here. If you put all the eggs in the basket of work, say, this is my self, my work is my measure of self-worth. My work is my measure of success. My work is my identity. So you're, you're not really seeking that outside of work. You're not looking at your community or your home or your social life for all of that. It's just work. 
in comes a bully and starts to attack you, you are devastated. Yeah. And you, if you don't have that healthy work life balance, this can be completely devastating. And that's why boundaries are important. You need to know who you are outside of work, have a good level of support, worse that's defined by your volunteer work or your education or your contribution and your community, that whole gamut. You won't be so derailed and devastated if you have some balance and self-care practice. So boundaries are incredibly important. If you don't have them, then I could say right now you need some help. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love that you share that. And it's interesting, as Linda's talking, I'm like, those characteristics are really powerful because they're so positive. <laughs> you know, they're hardworking, yeah. kind, um, you know, like all of these incredible dynamics. And but but apparently threatening to a bully. Well, I love that you point that out because research will tell you that 74 ish percent of the bullying that we are seeing in the world is top down. Now, that will upset a few leaders listening to this, but actually think about it. This is good information. This is how you solve the problem. Yes. If it's top down, then we need to look at our hiring practices. Are we putting people in positions of leadership that are competent and confident? Because I do not believe confident, competent leaders bully. They do not bully. There's a solution right there. So look at your hiring practices. Are you hiring for merit? Or are you putting people in positions because you owe them something or they're a family member or you can't find anybody else to take that position? Because now you're putting your, your staff at risk. So we need to start setting our leaders up for success. Hire them, train them, monitor them, coach them, mentor them, make them successful, and make sure your leadership team is a cohesive leadership team, everyone buying into zero tolerance, and we would wipe out 74% of the bullying. And let's face it, if we did that, those competent, confident leaders will not accept bullying from anybody bottom up or side to side. That's interesting you say that because... I, I love that you're talking about a level of taking responsibility, right? In terms of leadership, really looking at their hiring practices. Then as it relates to understanding quality leadership in regards to workplace bullying, uh, it's interesting. You, you, you talked about coaching and training. I think that's it's extremely important. I, I will tell you that I'm a former manager. I'm a former news director. I, um, when I was working as a news director, I also worked on my MBA. So I understand management and, and now I train managers. You know, one of the things that I, that I will say that I think is extremely important in the workplace, there, there's people sometimes in leadership positions that may not understand management, may have not been trained in management. What do you say to organizations in terms of what they can do to kind of really shift this dynamic? Well, again, make sure, review what your hiring practices are. Leadership, leadership sets the tone of a work environment. So what is the tone you want? you know, and mentor and, and train and monitor what those leaders are doing and have that inclusive. Now I train leaders and for the last, I would say five years, I asked this one question consistently with every class. Do you know your leadership style? And I get the deer in the headlights look with that. I rarely, I don't think I've ever gotten a full clear answer on what somebody's leadership style is. People don't even know what their leadership style is. You need to know, how do you measure what's working and what's not working? There are a couple of leadership styles out there that are actually high risk. And if you don't know what your leadership style is, how do you know you're not one of them? The authoritarian leadership style is one of those high risks. And that used to be the most common, most you know, popular leadership style. You don't want that authoritarian leadership style. That's a dominating, more abrasive, controlling, micromanaging type, you don't want that. You don't want to be an authoritarian leadership style. The other one is the laissez-faire. That is the bury your head in the sand, don't deal with stuff, I don't care anymore. I'm just gonna let staff you know, have resentments towards each other, unresolved staffing issues. These are very threatening, the high risk. So you need to know what your leadership style is. What works today? I would say start with emotional intelligence for a foundation. 
lead with emotional intelligence. Great foundation. And then look at some other and draw on it. Have a good toolbox because you work with a lot of different personalities. So you need to draw on situational leadership style, maybe. Sometimes it might be that more um, democratic. You need to look at these different styles, but have a foundation of emotional intelligence in your leadership style. I love that because that emotional intelligence dynamic is so important. You know, it to me, it speaks on empathetic leadership. Because then you can really bring compassion to an organization, which is as this great research as relates to compassionate work. It sparks innovation, but it, it you know, it's great to me in terms of the, the happiness scholar in me values it because it promotes levels of safety, you know, of people feeling that they can share, that their voice is going to be heard, that they're going to be seen. Right. Yeah. Because that's so super important if you work in a workplace where the bullies have outnumbered the, you know, or, or really, I should say, taken over the culture. It can be extremely challenging for that individual to walk in and to actually be able to share, hey, you know, I am being harassed or I am not comfortable hearing what this individual is saying to me um, and and taking it from from there. So so I love that in terms of understanding your style and then really kind of basing it as relates to e emotional intelligence. Is there anything that your institute does that really helps empowers managers as relates to that? Well, I would suggest that they take trauma-informed, in-depth training on what is and what is not psychological harassment, psychological violence in the workplace and what to do with it, what to do about it. Don't just go online and do a one-hour webinar, tick the box and say, I took it. We're talking in-depth trauma-informed. I think all leaders should be trauma-informed. I think all investigators should be trauma-informed. All HR, all um, safety officers should be trauma-informed on this issue. We're talking about psychological hazards and psychological safety and psychological injuries. So you need the trauma-informed piece. And unfortunately, a lot of people are avoiding that. But I also want to say, happy people do not bully. It's that simple. Wow. Happy people do not bully. So that says a lot about the individual who is creating this dynamic, right? It says a lot about who they are and, and, and where they are. It's interesting because Linda, it's, uh, as Linda is sharing, I'm thinking about my past experiences and then I'm, I'm weighing, I'm like, should I share? And I go, so I, I'm going to share this in a very general dynamic. You know, I, uh, I dealt with a workplace bully who would say things to me every time I walked down the hallway. And one of the things was uh, telling me this dynamic of, we haven't sent you a pink slip yet. And it went, I'm like, I'm like hello, I just started. Um, and, <laughs> and, and then every second, every second of, of, of hearing those dynamics. One day when he came into my office, um, you know, uh, he mentioned my, you know, my office and all the awards and so forth, opposed to saying, wow, wow, great job, because, you know, I was, you know, I, I valued everybody in the workplace. Oh, there's your vanity wall. You know, everything was discounting me. And one day, you know, I was walking down a hallway and and the individual says, you know, tries to talk to me. And I said, you know, I'm not entertaining you. Good for you. I'm not entertaining you, I'm not entertaining any of your negativity yeah. that, you know, and, and he stopped yeah. the, 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 the individual stopped, you know, you know, there were times during that work experience that I could see the envelope being pushed, mm -hmm. but what was really, I think, interesting is the fact that every time I walked down that hallway, that person chose to not say good morning or not say, I hope you're having a great day. Or wow, what are you doing in terms of your work? Or, you know, wow, it's great to see you, you know, um, was discounting me. Yeah. And, you know, whether they are aware of the, of the intention, it was deliberate. 
Yes. You know, that's important. I mean, some people are consciously aware, consciously intending to harm you, and some people are not. They're unconscious of it. They've been doing it for so long, getting away with it for so long. They've morally disengaged from their own behaviors and not even realizing that they're causing this harm. We absolutely have psychopaths in the workplace. We have sociopaths. We have narcissists. Absolutely. But they don't make up the majority of the bullies out there. Not in my opinion. I work with the bullies. They're sent to me on a mandatory basis. I've learned a great deal from these bullies. But they're not, the narcissist psychopaths don't come in because it's everybody else's fault. They've done nothing wrong, right? But the majority, in my opinion, are not. And, and they can change. There's a story that made them the way they are. This guy was obviously jealous of you. This woman, I don't know, was very jealous of you. My bully in the last job, and I bullied him many, was a psychologist immediately knew how to get under your skin. And once they're under your skin, we're in trouble. We need some help. But he would do the opposite of what yours did. He would walk down the hallway and say good morning to everyone except me. Day after day. Day after day. Eventually, that wears on you. At first, you laugh it off. But week after week after month, it gets to you when you start to notice. And he knew what he was doing. He also asked us to spy on each other. So he was setting up insecurity, paranoia, lack of trust, lack of safety by asking us to spy and report back to him. Interesting. And it's interesting. Yeah. I, I, thank you for sharing that experience. I'm so grateful for that because, you know, as someone that's a listener is who's who's really, you know, kind of jotting down notes or possibly feeling less alone as relates to this conversation. I love the, these examples because what it does, it allows them to say, what, well, wait a minute, are you telling me that this person didn't acknowledge you? And that, that, it, it, that, it, you know, that behavior of saying good morning to everyone else, and then all of a sudden treating someone else indifferently, you know, that says a lot as it relates to that individual's behavior. But then I, th I will say this as it would, what some of my friends when they're talking about, you know, different levels of bullying and so forth. And I have a dear friend has made it her platform to talk about bullying. You know, you begin to question, it's almost like gaslighting. You question your reality. And your example to me is it could be a question of reality. Like, did, did I just, did he or she not say anything? So yeah, you just nailed the insidious nature of this type of abuse. Because yes. who's going to notice that he's excluded me? Nobody's going to notice that. So if I bring it up, it looks like I'm a whiner, right? It looks like, oh, come on, get over it. You're, you're too sensitive and all that stuff. And my response to that is, I'm not too sensitive, he's too insensitive. Let's put the attention where, stop holding the fire hose of the smoke, <laughs> the fire's <laughs> over here. Yes. You know? But it is crazy making, and that's the intent. You question your own thinking, you question your own feelings. And often I say to people, it's like, you're standing there watching a train on its way to commit a complete train wreck in your life, personally and professionally. The train is coming. You know it's going to be a complete wreck. And everybody's going, I don't see the train. No, you don't see the train. Don't be silly. And you're, you're feeling crazy. So there's a component of institutional betrayal here. Internal betrayal. Your colleagues don't support you because they're scared. Or they maybe they're bullies too. I don't know. But, you know, there's a whole story there. HR doesn't support you because they're scared or unskilled, or maybe they're bullies too. Union doesn't support you because they're unskilled, or maybe they're bullies too. There's a reason for all of that, that internal systems betrayal. And then you have the external systems betrayal where your doctor doesn't know this injury. Maybe the therapist you're seeing doesn't know this injury, or human rights doesn't deal with it. You don't have policies or legislation. Internal, external betrayal adds to the injury. Wow, it does. And it's interesting that you say that because all of these different, all of these different dynamics, um, you, when, we, when we think of work, sometimes we, we, we may just simply think of dealing with maybe your direct supervisor and maybe some of the coworkers that you're dealing with, you know, directly. But I love how you're talking about this in terms of the levels of division from even the dynamics of HR in terms of possibly working, you know, as you mentioned, scared, you know, I, I it's interesting because it, you know, I, I can see a level of fear, like leading, leading through it in terms of having a level of fear that kind of permeates that dynamic. You said something earlier 
that I said I have to ask her about when you when you mentioned bullies and and working with bullies Mm -hmm. you you gave us such great insight as it relates to the characteristics of people who are bullied I'm curious with what you're comfortable with sharing with us Linda what have you learned from bullies well there's a lot of people out here that are not going to like what I say now I'm not talking remember about the psychological violence side of that where there is gaslighting extreme gaslighting where it's a narcissist psychopath I'm talking about the majority of others that have gotten away with it for year after year after year, maybe even promoted, maybe even a bonus at the end of the year because a good job of bullying people. These people have really disengaged and they, you know, whether they consciously intentional want to hurt you or they don't. And what I've learned is when I get through all those layers, you know, how we're told we're too sensitive, I say they have this callous skin that they've developed by getting away with it for years and years and years between their heart and their head. And they don't realize how much they're hurting. When I get through that callous layers of skin and find out who's under there, there's some decent human beings under there, but we got to get through that callous yet. Now, sometimes that is they suffer from a mental illness that they weren't, they never diagnosed. So I have worked with bullies that are actually full blown generalized anxiety disorder. And they have panic attacks and they're hiding it, they're ashamed. Or they have a physical illness that they were too afraid to go and get diagnosed. With treatment, they're not suffering anymore. Sometimes it's because they had a trauma as a child and they're reacting that. That's how they, they're now the, the offender. You know, they've never healed from that. They were bullied as a kid. So there's a lot. Some of them are actually trained to bully. They were hired. That was their first job. They have nothing to compare it to. They were rewarded for it. They were given bonuses for it. Nobody ever complained about it until finally somebody did and they had to come and see me. But that was their first job. And they thought it was right. They had no idea. That's what their bosses did. So there's all kinds of stories here, you know, of why people do what they do. If they don't have a personality disorder like narcissism. Very few people are diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, but there are many people walking out there, walking around with traits of narcissism. And that number is growing, by the way. So we will see a lot of that. And it's, they need to be held accountable. We need to make complaints. They need to have our notes so that we're credible for our investigation. And then when the leadership team decides we need to deal with this guy or this woman, we want to keep them because they're good at their job but they need to change these behaviors. They need to make them accountable and send them to someone like me who can work with them in a rehab program that is educational coaching and even treatment if treatment is needed. And what does that treatment look like, Linda? Um, how, how do you go about, you know, uh, what does I should say, what are some of those practices as it relates to really helping to treat um, a, a workplace bully? Well, first of all, like I said, we need to get them through, get past all that denial, minimizing justification, blaming everybody else. We have a process to get there first. And that's through the education, coaching, look at the investigative report, look at policies, look at research and show them how all that connects. Get them to that place where they see it. And then when they see it, we can look at those reasons. What was the barriers? What were the causes? Where did this come from? What do you need to heal? Do you need a doctor to assess your gastrointestinal problem that prevents you from leaving the home? Do we need a psychiatrist to diagnose the mental illness that you might be treated? So there's a whole gamut, but they need to get to that place of seeing it first. That's the unique process right there. Wow. So it's really about them seeing it, really taking responsibility and being able to, 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 to face it. It's interesting that you that you say that because Earlier, you talked about, um, you know, uh, workplace bullying and, 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 and really talked about the person that's been bullied. Right. And you talked about how it can have this kind of a ripple effect. So for those who are listening, who are dealing with a loved one that is really feeling the level of torture at work. And maybe here we are dealing with the person who was this you know, very positive person has his great light. And now it is just, it's diminishing because I I've seen this firsthand with some friends. What do you say to that loved one to be able to help serve 
that their their friend, their family member, or whoever the case may be, maybe even a coworker, right? Someone who's thinking about a coworker right now. What what do you say to them in terms of helping to guide them to help that other individual? I'd like to give you a twofold answer because I want to talk about the friend, the colleague, the loved one, but I also want to talk about the bystander. So first, I'll start here with the friend, the love, the, the colleague, or the loved one. Validation. Remember, we talked about this being crazy making. Validate, validate, validate. You don't have to see it to validate it. You can say, "My God, this looks. This is horrible. This must have been terrible for you." Don't make promises you can't keep, but be there for them and validate. Show them the research. Look at this. This is what you're going through. Go with them to an appointment with the doctor. Go with them to an appointment with a coach or a counselor. Be there for them. But validate, validate. My husband was relentlessly supportive, never ever wavered. He knew what I was going through. The hugs, making dinner for me, whatever you can to take the stress off. But validation, validation, right? At the workplace, again, same thing. Colleague, validate. Hey, that was wrong. Don't forget you've got policies here and don't, don't forget you've got an employment assistance program that you can go and get some help. Or, hey, I found out about this person over here. In the United States, you've got Dr. Gary Namey of the Workplace Bullying Institute. He can connect you to a coach and a therapist if you want somebody in the USA. All around the world, doesn't matter where you're living today, you have a resource. If you can't find them, you can phone me, email me. I'll help you find that resource. For loved ones, family as well, and remember to take care of yourself because we don't want you becoming an insomniac as well. So see the doctors, learn what you can, support each other, talk about it. I love that. And I love the fact that you're talking about a lot of sleepless nights because that's what happens, right? When you're experiencing bullying at work um, and, you know, you're trying to understand those circumstances and then sometimes you may internalize them and begin to think, oh, gosh, is it me or why me? Right. And why is this person kind of pointing me out, you know, or then you start to begin to see um, that uh, the workplace bully just didn't signal you or, you know, or just is, is directing it towards you. You know, then you'll be, you might be able to notice uh, what that looks like across the board. I'm curious about that for, you know, in terms of the work that you've noticed as it relates to workplace bullies, do they just, just decide on one person or do we see a pattern as it relates to, you know, wow, this person has really begun to kind of stretch their, their bullying to not just one, but multiple individuals at work. Yeah. Well, sometimes there's just one at a time which means it's not always just one. And sometimes there is two or more, and we would call that mobbing, right? So uh, mobbing would be a, it's a gang mentality of bullying. So it would have to be two or more people that you make it up as a mobbing team. That's interesting. That's interesting, mm-hmm. mobbing. Uh, you know, I, I, I hate this part because I, uh, <laughs> I have to wrap up our conversation. And I hate this because I have been, so excited. This has been a, a interview for me a year in the making of being able to talk to Linda and to be able to learn from her. And I'm so grateful for all the information that that you shared, Linda. For those of individuals that are listening that also like me, that they don't want this to end, um, <laughs> tell them where they can find you. Well, they can find me on social media and they can find me on the internet under the Canadian Institute of Workplace Bullying. Uh, they can find me. I hope you'll put up my link and my phone number on your website. Do. I do want to say that I, I do want to share about bystanders at some point, if ever we can talk about that. I think it's critically important that we do. I would love to, uh, but they can look at your website and find my link there. That would probably be the easiest. I love that. And yes, I am, you know, I, I like that Linda just mentioned that because that means she's coming back. And so... <laughs> selfishly I just like what you just shared Linda so we're going to have a great discussion coming up soon as relates to bystanders so I'm looking forward to that this now this is a question I ask everyone that's on the courting happiness podcast I am so curious because you're an individual that really literally is helping the world in regards to helping to serve uh, safer workplaces um, in terms of workplace bullying I am curious as a person who is committed 
to helping other individuals, how do you commit to your well-being and your happiness journey? What do you do to, to make sure that you are kind of pouring into your, your cup? I take breaks, time off. I make sure I get good sleep and I eat the right food and I do a lot of crafts and I have a fantastic husband and a beautiful little Yorkie that is my emotional support dog. <laughs> You can only imagine how, uh, what is your Yorkie's name? Isla. Oh gosh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Oh, I hope my fiance is listening to this podcast episode because, <laughs> because I've been looking at, you know, little dogs for myself. So I love that you shared that in terms of the support system of your family and what that looks like. Honestly, thank you so much for your time today. I really treasured everything that you shared in terms of empowering us in terms of workplace bullies and then also giving us insight as it relates to the bullies themselves. You are phenomenal. And for those of you who are listening, please make sure you follow Linda on uh, on uh, Instagram. I will have all of her information on her episode page of this podcast. Linda, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Let's continue this conversation online. Email us at podcast at drcourtneyalston.com. That's podcast at D-R-K-O-R-T-N-I-A-L-S-T-O-N dot com. Join us on Instagram at Courting Happiness. Don't forget that's courting with a K. Also, I hope you join our private Facebook community. You can find us at Courting Happiness podcast community. Our private Facebook group is a safe haven to share, meet more people looking to build positive relationships, focus on well-being and create a happier life. Now, are you ready to spread happiness? We hope you subscribe and share this podcast with your family, friends, co-workers, and all the important people in your world. We release a new episode every Thursday. Congratulations on your continued commitment to your courting happiness journey. Thank you so much for listening. We want you to be well, be happier, and be kinder to yourself. We can't wait to see you next week.